Hi, I'm Steve Hayes at the University of Nevada in Reno, and I'm pleased to be able to speak with you today. The organizers of this conference uh, recently sent me an email and said, we'd like you very much to talk about mental and behavioral resilience and how we as humans can optimize our well-being despite life's difficulties and uh, naturally occurring obstacles that we all face. And I thought that was a, a, a kind thing to ask me to hold forth on, and then I finished the rest of the sentence in which they said, and you have 15 minutes. So I uh, turned that little bit of uh, lemons into lemonade and decided that it was an interesting challenge to try to summarize 40, 45 years of work into 15 minutes. And I've what occurred to me is I could do it the way you might do it with a uh, with a tweet. There's only so many characters you can put into a tweet. And so if you want to send out something that uh, says a lot of things, you've got to be very careful to say them in an efficient way. And so at the end of this talk, I will uh, edit it in. Uh, the tweet that I wrote, which fits the character limits of that odd form of communication. And in six points summarizes much of what I have learned. I say I, I mean myself and my colleagues over the last 45 years about psychological flexibility, which is the term for the overarching set of processes that we focused on that are most helpful to people in facing those naturally occurring life obstacles and in finding a way to prosper instead of heading into the cul-de-sacs that we call by various names including various so-called mental illness categories. The work that I do in intervention is called acceptance and commitment therapy or in a non-therapy context, acceptance and commitment training. And either way, the initial is ACT, A-C-T, but we never say it by initials. Uh, it sounds a lot cooler just to, just to say ACT. And the work on ACT has shown in now more than uh, 850, after we posted some new ones coming in, randomized trials, and about 5,000 other studies that have looked at these small set of principles that I'll spend 15 minutes talking about. If you wanted to summarize those six, you'd say that if people want to prosper, they need to learn to be more open, more aware, and more actively engaged in a values-based life. You could say it in a smaller set of words. You, learn, you need to learn to be more psychologically flexible. You could say it even smaller, down to a single word. You need to find a way to be more loving to yourself and others. You can get it down to a single letter. We are challenged in life to learn how to be. So here are the six components that we've identified of psychological flexibility. They're not just a theoretical exercise. In each case, there's measures of these things. There's studies on these things. There's kernels that move these things. We know that they fit together, just like six sides of a box. And if you want to have a strong box, you want to have all six sides be strong. If you have even one that isn't, or never mind, two or three, try to stand on that box and it will collapse. And in the same way, if we're going to live life in a way that is both strong and resilient, it is not brittle and flexible and prone to cracking and breakage. We need to strengthen all six of these aspects and none of us have it right. None of us are ever finished. This is a life agenda, a life course, but it's as far as I know, there's not a finish line. You don't get a grade at the end. You are always in the process of becoming stronger and more flexible by deploying these six skills. Number one, 
experience your own experience with a sense of kindness, of self-compassion, of curiosity, of awareness, and to do that without avoidance or domination or clinging. Life's experiences come and go. Emotions ebb and flow. Bodily sensations are here and then gone. Memories are there and then pass away and come back. And that's the very nature of human experience. And if you try to interfere with that, either by clinging to it and having only the good ones stay, well, you've now taken that butterfly of happiness or connection or uh, wonder and by the very act of clinging you've crushed the life out of it and closer to home for many of us if you try to avoid if you fight if you run away if you hide if you flop and failure on the floor if you do any of those things when difficult emotions or memories or bodily sensations or urges or thoughts or experience of any kind appear when you do that you now are more focused on it. You're ironically more likely to actually engage in it. It's more present, more central. You're creating neurobiological grooves from whatever else is happening to that very thing that you say that you want less of. And so if you want your experiences to play a natural role where they can carry the past, your emotions, for example, or echoes very often of the past and of features of the present that bring them to mind. If you want to be able to access that information, you have to allow them to ebb and flow. There isn't a single emotion that you can name that isn't useful to you sometimes. In fact, you pay good money to produce them, whether it's riding roller coasters to produce a bit of fear, reading uh, a sad novel to produce uh, that vulnerability, this, that bittersweet quality of sadness and vulnerability, the um, emotions of embarrassment, you watch television shows or so forth which produce it, and on and on it goes. So allow those experiences to appear and notice them with a sense of kindness with a sense of self-compassion and then turn your attention towards what's of importance. Do the same thing with your thoughts. Take a step back from your thoughts. Your thoughts say they are what in fact they aren't. They will tell you I'm you. They will tell you this is horrible. They're... No, these are added on to your experiences. The rest of creation doesn't have analytic, judgmental, symbolic language of that kind. They do perfectly well. And our spiritual and religious traditions, even our wisdom traditions, orient us towards the centrality of that with teaching us mindfulness skills or skills of uh, detachment done through contemplation or through focusing on uh, uh, things that are of more importance. So learn how to step back from your mind the judgmental, analytic, critical part of it, which doesn't just go outwards, it goes back directly at you. And watch its work. There's things in there that are useful. When you need to solve a problem that's really a problem, like fixing your car or investing your money, fine, use that analytic, judgmental side. But when you're trying to decide whether or not uh, you're a good person or life is worth living, if you've ever tried that, you're into the one of those things where the more positive things you say, the more negative argument you get. Or conversely, the more negative you go, the more your mind tries to reassure you that it's not that bad. So if you want to step out of that cacophony, if you want to back out of that to and fro, learn how to watch thinking in flight enough that you can notice that you're thinking. And then you have some choices because you haven't disappeared into that cognitive network. You know how to do this. Sometimes you do. When you see a sunset, you look at it and you say, wow, and then you're quiet. You know full well that it is not the time to say, but you know, it would have been a lot better if it had a cloud shaped like that. 
And in the same way, if you're in front of a crying child, you may say, wow. You may give the child a hug and you probably don't say, man, you're bumming me out. Why don't you go cry elsewhere? So don't do that to yourself either. Learn how to say wow to your own thoughts, feelings, memory, and put a period in the end of it. Not always, but when it's needed, which will allow you to be more open. How to be more aware? Well, learn to allocate your attention in a flexible and fluid and voluntary way to what's present. That can include the thoughts that are present, if you have those other skills I just talked about, the emotions that are present, same thing, but especially, what does the environment afford? Who else is here? What's possible? What could happen? And be here now. And be here, not just in a form of pretense or trying to get other people to think something in a particular way, not in, inside some personalities, persona, Greek root of that word is a mask. Take off the mask. You are not your act. You are not any one thing. You are not the big five personality. You have all five within you. You're not any goofy inventory that tells you you're this kind or that kind. Oh, please. You're all those kinds in different contexts. And the issue is, can you bring your best into this context? And that isn't helped by buying some little cognitive story that your mind gives you and crawling inside that clown suit and trying to be that. You're not that. You're a whole human being and parts of you even go beyond your verbal awareness, intuition, sense, etc. Evolution prepared us to do that and far, far, far earlier than these cognitive abilities we're displaying right now, which are hundred or a thousand times more recent than your basic biological processes of learning and remembering that we share with the rest of creation. So learn to attend in a flexible, fluid, and voluntary way with what's present, and to do it from this perspective or point of view of the witnessing, noticing, observing part of you that is beyond categorization, that doesn't even have a name, doesn't have features other than here, now. You'll find that you connect in consciousness to others from there, this more spiritual part of you. When you take the time to look in the eyes of another person and you see consciousness, you're seeing that kernel of awareness, that fromness of awareness that is beyond categories, beyond the story. You'll never be inadequate in that way. You'll never be good or bad or smart or dumb pretty or ugly in that way. This deeper part of you that connects you to others that began when you first opened your eyes and look in the eyes of your parent and you dumped endorphins, just at the kind eyes around you, when you yearned for a connection to the community around you, you can connect with at any time, simply by slowing down and showing up and catching that there's more to you than your story. And once you're there, these four, four skills are really essentially mindfulness skills, you might say. You're present, flexibly in the now from this witnessing point of view, and you're more open. You now are open and aware, and it's time to be actively engaged. Those things are not ends in themselves. They're a platform from which you can move forward. Move forward with what? I don't know. What do you really care about? I don't mean just the goals, I mean the direction. What are the values? What do you want to stand for? What do you instantiate? Who are your heroes? Who are your guides? What's on the other side of that pain? Why were you hurt so when you were betrayed? Or why did that social anxiety penetrate so when you wanted to connect with others? Flip it over and you'll see that your pain, your joy, the story that you're writing the heroes that you pick all point towards what you care about. And those things are not achievements. They're not, you know, the money, the prize. They're, they're intrinsic to the journey. They're intrinsic to what you do. And once you're there and you're a little clearer about what the direction is that you want to follow, I could say you're clear about what your values are, not in the sense of what you should have, not in the sense of what mama makes, you know, what you'll, you can say that would make mama happy, not for someone else, 
not for achievement, not for a prize, but between you and the person in the mirror, what am I up to? What do I care about that I want to put into my qualities of being and doing so that this journey is about something that I have now? At the very moment that you realize that you care about being a loving person or bringing beauty into the world or helping others, at that very moment, you're already doing the thing that you hope your journey will be about. You're already on that journey. And from there, the only issue is, can you build habits around it? Can you build broader and more flexible, deeper, more persistent ways of deploying your life's moments in such a way that you can manifest, instantiate, give an example to your own self of that yearning towards meaning and purpose that you have inside you. And so at that moment, we're about the business of creating habits of values-based action. If you do all those things, what do those 5,000 or so studies show? you're much more likely to have your life unfold in a way that makes a difference in the world that is healthy for you and that contributes to the well-being of others. You can step forward with all of your past pains and difficulties, with all of your limitations and challenges, with all of your doubt and fears and scary thoughts and step forward and step forward again and creating a life that's worth living. So that's 40 years and 15 minutes. I hope it was useful to you. And if you want to know more about that or my work, you can just Google psychological flexibility or acceptance and commitment therapy or training or act. Or if you uh, want to follow me and my work, go to my website, just my name at stephenchays.com, and I'll send you my blogs and stuff. I don't spam people. You can get out with a one click. And if none of that interests you, then at least look around for you. Look around and see if you didn't see in this very conference some wisdom as to how to build these six psychological flexibility skills. Peace, love, and life.